I'll open it, my wife, Sue, shouted from upstairs. She headed to the door to answer the bell. I guess she thought I was upstairs when in fact I was reading my e-book in the unlit living room. I had already started to get up since I was only a few steps from the front door, but when she said that she would open it herself, I sat down again. I had only lived here for a couple of weeks, so it was hardly a visit to me. Oh, what do you want? There was contempt in my wife's voice. I have child support for the next three months, and if possible, I would like to give them Christmas gifts. Apparently, the speaker was Mike Lawrence, Sue's recent ex-husband. Well, it won't work. Now is not the right time. You can pick them up on the weekend and give them your gifts then. Sue, be reasonable. You know, I don't have a car. I lost my company car when you fired me. Mike, let's not go back in time. This is the past. We are divorced. You have visitation rights with the children, and I will ensure that the boys are always available as scheduled. But they are getting used to the new person in this house. It would be confusing for them if you spent time with them too. Make appointments at your new home. That's the point. I don't have a home. I'll have to leave town. This is my only chance to see the boys. Please, we spent many good years together until you decided to move on. Let me see my sons. This is my last chance for a long time. Sorry, no. I had to think fast. Nothing I heard added up. I couldn't imagine my wife not allowing her children to see their father. I was out of sight of the hallway. When the door was open, it was not visible from the living room. I quickly stood up and said, Why is the door open? I went out into the hallway and saw my wife standing, blocking her ex-husband's entry into the house. About, Mike, isn't it? I'm Larry Compton. Sorry, I dozed off and didn't hear the call. Why don't you invite him in, Sue? Sue looked at me as if I had written something obscene on her shoes. I'll sort it out, honey, she said through clenched teeth. Oh, I'm sure you can handle it. But no matter your background, a man can be allowed in. It's freezing outside. Sue took a step back, allowing him to enter, but still practically blocking the entrance to the house. Mike stepped inside and stepped aside. I closed the front door. Sue's position told me that I still had work to do. Boys, I shouted towards their rooms, your dad has come. The amazing thing about children is that they hear well when they are interested in a topic, but they don't hear well when it doesn't interest them. A moment later, they both rushed out of their rooms, walked down the stairs, and hugged their dad. Sue looked at me as if her current marriage was doomed unless her husband wised up. Mike had a hard time holding the boys in his arms, he had a wrapped box in each hand. What's in the boxes? asked the younger boy, Billy. Even at six years old, he understood that it was December 21st, and two boxes plus two brothers meant gifts. For the first time in our short life, only two, including this acquaintance of Mike, saw his eyes light up. He had a plan. These are your Christmas presents, boys. I was hoping to give them to you sooner. He looked at Sue. Both boys stared at their mother. Can I open them now, Mom? Tom asked. At ten, he already considered himself too old for the name Tommy. Sue looked like she was lost in the desert. Apparently, the correct answer was yes, and she didn't want to say it, but she couldn't think of anything else. I decided that I couldn't make things worse for myself. She was already furious with me, so why not? Of course, boys, this is a great idea. Why don't you go to the living room? Sue, could you make them some hot chocolate and give Mike some coffee? She knew she would look bad if she said anything different and smiled warmly. What a wonderful idea. We can all sit and watch them open their presents. No, I think I'll show them to the living room, and when you're done with the drinks, I'll go back to my book. This is the time for you four. Sue hesitated, but turned and walked into the kitchen. The boys headed in the other direction, through the dining room, into the living room. Mike went with them. I grabbed his hand. He turned to me. Mike, I heard your conversation. I have an apartment just four blocks from here. Do you know Carling Towers? Certainly. I'll leave you a key and a note on the porch when you leave. Please take them and spend the night there. I want to talk to you in the morning. 
I didn't understand why Sue didn't want to let you in. Will you do this? No, Larry. I don't need charity from the man who stole my wife. Mike, I promise you, this is not charity. I'll leave a key and a note. At least read the note. Promise me. Listen, I have a few minutes to spend with my sons. Let me do this. I will read your note, because without your help, I would not have received this either. We went to the living room. Mike settled down with the boys and Sue was almost finished with the drinks and cookies. I returned to my living room. I sat down at the computer. I had little time to write a note. Mike, I overheard your conversation with Sue. He worried me a lot. We need to talk. My opinion about you has changed dramatically. I don't know how long it will take you to unwrap your presents, so I have to leave this note on the porch quickly. Let me put it this way. I would never intentionally steal someone's wife. I was told that your marriage was over long before there was any relationship between me and Sue. I heard you quit your job so you wouldn't be around her. There's no reason to believe me. But if you have nowhere to stay, spend the night in my apartment, and in the morning at 8 o'clock we will talk. Tell me I'm wrong if that's what you think. At least you'll have a good night. Use any bedroom. I don't know what to eat or drink, but everything is at your disposal. Larry. I printed out the document, took the envelope, put the key and the note inside, and left it on the last step of the porch. The porch was three steps above the ground. I was sure Mike would see the note as he left, but she wouldn't be able to see it from the door. I was sure that Sue would not accompany him. I could write a longer letter. The boys extended the meeting for more than an hour. I hoped the note was enough. At night, the temperature was supposed to drop to minus values. If the note doesn't convince him, then hopefully being homeless and a cold night will convince him to accept my offer. Crap, crap, crap. This is exactly what I was afraid of. Sue is my second wife. We've only been married a few weeks since the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Her divorce was finalized a few days earlier. My first wife and I met in college, she at the University of Pennsylvania and I at Wharton Business School. We fell in love, got married, and settled into a beautiful house outside the city. We lived in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, but most of my business was conducted in nearby New Jersey. My business is real estate development. I'm great at raising money and getting people together to revitalize neighborhoods in neighboring cities like Newark, Trenton, Camden, and so on. I have a talent for organizing these deals. We lived well. Jane was studying to be a teacher. She went to college because that was the way to go after high school. She chose teaching because of her love for children. This is all a polite way of saying that she was looking for a husband. In truth, she was a little out of her time. She believed that being a wife and mother was as important an achievement as any other goal. When we met, I was struck by her old-fashioned views. But she was smart, funny, charming, beautiful, and a wonderful lover. Add to this the fact that she wanted to be a mother and a housewife for me, and she became irresistible to me. We were the perfect couple. The problem was that I often left for business on Mondays and returned late on Friday, week after week, without end for the foreseeable future. And then tragedy happened. My wife and our daughter were killed in our house by thieves. Our house had a sophisticated security system, but Jane didn't turn it on. She tried to press the panic button, which literally led to death. Because I was chasing success, I wasn't there to help. Because I was so successful, I needed to be home. My thirst for success led me to ignore her careless attitude towards safety. My inaction led to her death. What ate at me the most was that I chose a 1-E-950-S style marriage, half a century too late. Of course, this was the life Jane wanted, but I allowed her to live it. In those days, people were safe at home. Jane and I have created a wonderful life for ourselves within the walls of our home. Jane isolated herself from the harsh realities of our time. We lived in an affluent area with large wooded lots and houses set back from the road. Our house was not visible from the road, which gave her a sense of security. It also gave confidence to criminals who decided to rob our home. No one knew about the break-in until she sounded the alarm. Although she called the police, this resulted in them being killed. 
I was broken. All I have left is work. I began to strive for more to work harder and faster. I wasn't looking for a second wife. I thought it was unfair. Instead, I used my wealth to find temporary companions. I was content to run after them, get what I wanted, and then let them go. It wasn't right for me, but it suited me in the short term. And then I met Sue. The people in the hallway interrupted my thoughts. The boys were delighted, said goodbye to their father, and wished him good night and a merry Christmas. Sue acted nice and diligently showed her ex-husband out the door. Finally, she succeeded. When he left, Sue took the boys upstairs to put them to bed. His eyes were red, and he was on the verge of tears. I moved towards him to talk, but he walked past me. I pointed to the step. First step. He left the house, went down the steps, walked past the envelope, but stopped, stood a little, turned, picked it up, put it in his coat pocket, and walked off into the night. Nothing about this visit worked out. It was very cold at night. My wife's ex-husband showed up on foot, wearing a jacket completely inappropriate for the weather. He just wanted to see his children, and if not for my intervention, he would have been sent home. I have to ask Sue for an explanation. She walked down the stairs looking irritated. Why did you go against my clear desire to keep this man out of our home? She almost screamed. Now I had to make a decision. She told me that her ex quit his job. He said he was fired. I was hoping to talk to him tomorrow. I needed to get as much information from her as possible. Should I tell her my intentions or be dishonest? When in doubt, lie. What do you mean? How was I supposed to know that you didn't want the boy's father to come into the house? I added emotion and volume to my voice, similar to hers. You heard what I said. Oh, so that's what you think. Actually, no, I haven't. I slept in a chair. The cold air woke me up, and I got up to find out why the door was open. Her tone changed. Didn't you hear our conversation? Why? What are you hiding or trying to hide? Her tone became defensive. How dare you? I'm not hiding anything. I just thought you heard and knew I didn't want him to come over, but you invited him anyway. I shook my head, smiling. I spoke much softer. You know me better than that. We need to calm down. Let's have a glass of wine and talk. If there's a reason you don't want your ex around boys, I want to know more about it. I went for wine. I had a bad feeling everything was so wonderful. Sometimes things are good, but my experience is that nothing is perfect. It's been two years since I lost my meaning in life. I felt only two emotions, overwhelming sadness and emptiness from my own helplessness. I followed two treatments. To cope with the sadness, I worked insanely hard, and to fill the void, I found women for myself. Thanks to my success, I could have any woman whenever I wanted. Some men worry about size or technique. Such people lack the confidence that a large bank account gives. It's a superficial existence, but at least it gave me a distraction. Almost every woman I've dated has been content with a one or two time affair. I didn't feel guilty about using them because they were using me too. Don't get me wrong, but a man can get his fill of great food, good wine, and consistent sex. I was dissatisfied with this dissolute existence, but it muffled the emptiness and gave me the illusion of my own consistency. My love and my daughter died because I couldn't protect them and I couldn't allow another woman to suffer the same fate. I swore to myself that if I ever decided to take another chance, things would have to change dramatically. So I endured these hedonistic evenings. The first time I met Sue, we had a wonderful evening. I haven't really talked to anyone in a long time. Of course, business negotiations and seduction are one thing, but real conversations are completely different. It was funny because our conversation was not deep in the usual sense. Sue told me what she did, and I talked about my work. But somehow it turned out that by describing what we do, we told who we are. Moreover, we showed how similar we are. We chatted for a few minutes before introducing ourselves to each other. When she said her name was Sue Lawrence, I asked if she was related to Mike Lawrence. Her face changed, and she answered, only by marriage, and fell silent. She felt uneasy, and since I did not look at her with lust, I did not develop this topic. We ended the evening with a handshake.
I don't date married women, even for one evening. She made no indication that she would agree to the proposal if I made one. I thought this Riesling would be good, I said, handing her the glass. Sorry if I was harsh. She paused, exhaled, and looked into my eyes. No, I'm sorry for being harsh. I don't like my behavior, and I apologize. This is more like the Sue I married. Tell me why you don't want him in the house for Christmas. Boys already have a hard time getting used to new circumstances. There weren't many parents around when we were both busy. But when Mike fell on hard times, it turned out to be a good thing for them. We never really discussed it. What do you mean hard times? I asked this question because when I first met Sue and asked if she was related to Mike Lawrence, it was because I was researching him as a potential business partner. Mike was a man whose skills could be useful. I looked at several leading people in town and Mike was the best choice for me. Then Sue showed up and to avoid complications, I crossed Mike off the list. Sue continued, Mike was the manager of the Vegas casino, hotel and shops here. When the casino fell into disrepair and the upscale town collapsed, he lost his job. The parent company offered him a position at their flagship hotel in Las Vegas, but I had just been promoted to vice president of sales and didn't want to leave. Wow, that left him with no opportunity to do anything close to his old job, let alone a paycheck. Wasn't it a huge thing for him to stay for you and the boys? Great deed or sacrifice, that's the problem. He always made more than me, but my promotion put me at the level he was at. My progress has been significant. Its downgrade is devastating. He couldn't find his new place in life. And you fired him? It was stupid, because I said that I was sleeping and didn't hear anything. Maybe she won't notice. Yes, he worked three levels below me and was not a salesman. We couldn't cope with this while we were married, especially after the divorce. She hesitated for half a second. Damn, she realized my mistake. But she continued, I think she decided not to accuse me of this. Crap, I'm trying to get her to be honest, and now I'm caught knowing things I claim to have slept through. On the other hand, she admitted that she fired him. I guess I would say he quit too. Why show cruelty to your new husband? On the other hand, if I want honesty, I need to be honest. I wonder what she'll think if I offer Mike a job. A high-level casino manager has experience in many things. This is exactly the kind of person I need in development. He already has a job. Let him go. Her response was too quick and dismissive. It was about getting rid of him, not helping him use his talents. I think it's okay because he's not her concern anymore. What about your boys? Don't know. You're right, probably. You and I are working together. It scares me. Well, there is this too. I can't say that I have a completely different feeling. But for a long time now, I have not been able to do without a strong operational person. Maybe that's what he's like. Her answers seemed correct. She didn't try to deceive me and, in fact, forgave me for my false answer when I said that I was sleeping, although I knew that she fired him. I needed to hear from her ex-husband. I wonder if he will agree to talk to me. He called me a wife thief. I think I was involved in their marriage ending. I might not even find him tomorrow. Sue passed the test, but I missed the opportunity to learn more. She smiled, then hugged me. You're so cute. I noticed it right away. This tough businessman is actually soft at heart. It would be great if he stayed here in the city, and if it suits you, then that's even better. How do her words fit with my memories? When we first met, we had an immediate connection. She was wearing wedding and engagement rings, so I didn't even try to flirt, but an understanding arose between us. I was relatively new to town and came here because of the recent collapse of the local casinos. It was a fashionable destination, but the harsh eastern weather brought the big money back to Las Vegas. We met in a bar opposite the central office of the company where she worked. She was vice president of sales. I didn't go back to that bar for probably a month. And then, of course, I met her there again. This time she wasn't wearing any rings. We talked a little, and she said her marriage was over. She was worried about herself and her sons. What did she say then? 
I don't remember exactly, but it seems to me that there were strong emotions in her voice, but the words were not so alarming. I think she said her husband lost his job. This must have been about the casino hotel. At that time he was already working for her. Why didn't she tell about it? On the other hand, I can't remember anything specific that we discussed regarding her marriage. We were focused on our future, not her past. Sue was the first woman who made me feel like I could heal my broken heart. Jane's life as a housewife and mother who lived for her family made her vulnerable. Sue had no such vulnerability. I was so tired of one-off meetings and a series of nameless women. They didn't deserve this, and I didn't deserve it either. Before I met Sue, I just couldn't stop. Sue was supposed to be my return to normalcy. I gave up winning and moved on to dating one woman as soon as I could or as soon as she could. For us, this meant that we could see each other for three days in a row and then not see each other for three weeks. During our meetings, we were able to cross paths twice during separate business trips. I fell madly in love with both Sue and the idea of Sue. She was independent, self-sufficient, purposeful, not to mention completely relaxed in bed. It's funny that I linked these qualities together, but that was the basis of our relationship. I was so excited to meet a woman who was so different from my late wife. The more I got to know Sue, the less I was tormented by the memory of Jane. At first, it all came from our business side. When I first started looking at her as a business partner, it was just a professional meeting without any flirting. But she was the first to take the step towards us becoming something more. She didn't need much courtship, I was already head over heels in love. But was she as in love with me as I was with her? Or was I a good improvement over her unsuccessful husband? I have succeeded in my business because I look at everything with skepticism. This is how I came to success, and these are the yellow eyes that I use when evaluating everything. Do I want to use them now? After all, she admitted to me that she fired him, although she had previously said that he left on his own. What else is hidden? Sue, this is not the best way to celebrate our first Christmas. Santa left you a present in my shorts. Santa, and what makes you think that such an act is my gift? She said. Perhaps you will receive a gift yourself. Well, I see that this is a discussion that will take a lot of time and effort. Are you sure you're ready for this? It seems like it's your job to bring up your issue. I guarantee that I will do my job. We retreated to the bedroom and did our best to find out who exactly was receiving the gift. Nothing was decided, but by morning we no longer had the strength to continue the clarification. Why do you get up so early? Sue asked, hugging me, not letting me get out of bed. Early meeting. Larry, you know you don't date someone this early. What's happening? Sue, I want to discuss a new operating idea. With my ex-husband. Well, damn it, marrying a smart woman sometimes has its downsides. She understood everything only by what time I got up. Yeah, well, sorry it bothers you. Is that all? Do you want to know about him and me? Now it's time for sleight of hand or words. Sue, last night this man called me a wife thief. I don't think he's interested in discussing his past with you. This is true. Of course, I will do my best to change his mind. Larry, you understand that if you start digging into our past, his story will be different from mine. What will you do then? You act like I want to find something bad in our marriage. Why should I want this? It's just that your ex-husband has all the skills I need for a huge project to renovate an old casino. Don't worry about it. She didn't look entirely satisfied with this incomplete answer. I decided to kiss her goodbye and see what I could learn from her ex-husband. She asked me what I would do when it turned out that their stories didn't match. This question was significant because there was no chance that their versions would match. Heck, even if they tried to tell the same story, they couldn't. Since their interests are different, I will definitely get different stories. What should I do? Starting a new marriage with doubts about your wife. Maybe it's better for me not to find out anything. But that's just stupid. Turning a blind eye to reality is an invitation to disaster. Close my eyes, bury my face in the sand, and I am vulnerable. How can I justify not learning more? I'm stuck. 
I don't want to know more, but I have to find out. I keep coming back to the fact that I am successful in business because I am a skeptic. I don't take anything at face value. On the other hand, how can a new marriage be successful on the basis of skepticism? One thing I pride myself on is determination. This endless stream of questions and doubts is anything but decisive. You need to decide and act. I entered the apartment through the door that connected the garage to the laundry room. This room was connected to the kitchen where Mike sat and drank coffee. There was an empty plate of cutlery in front of him. Apparently, he had found something for breakfast. Good morning, I said, trying to sound as cheerful as possible. He looked at me, morning, without much enthusiasm. Forgive me, but I have a strong hatred for you that is breaking through despite my attempts to be grateful over the past twelve hours. Fine, I answered more with a question than a statement. Let me start this way. I had no relationship with your wife until she took off the rings and said the divorce was in the works. If you think otherwise, then we need to discuss how I can convince you that what I am saying is true or how you can convince me otherwise. Agree? His face remained stern, but not closed. You stress me out when you stand. I know how meetings with opponents go. Pour yourself some coffee, sit down, and you and I will try to figure out what we need from each other. Agree? I didn't answer, I just turned around, poured a cup of coffee, and sat down. He clearly had negotiation skills. His face became a little softer, although he was not smiling. That's better. First of all, I cannot express my gratitude to you. Sue wasn't going to let me see the boys, and I was going to leave tonight. I only had a few dollars left and a small credit card that was almost maxed out. I was worried about whether I would be able to find a motel and whether the card would allow me to stay overnight. If not, I would have to walk to the airport, and in this cold I could freeze to death. You are a smart and successful guy. How did you end up in this situation? I saw something click in his head. He was thinking about what to say. Before we answer, let's shake hands and agree to be honest. I won't hold you back on your first words. You said them before we made our agreement. I immediately extended my hand. I swear I'll be honest with you. My first statement still stands. And now I give you my word that it was true. Maybe we'll need time to trust each other. Liars always swear to tell the truth. But this is a good start. Thank you for your offer. We shook hands. Both hands were steady, and we looked into each other's eyes, as if that would help us see the truth. An outside observer might believe that we are both honest. I wasn't sure, and I knew he felt the same. But this was the start. I continued to look at him. If he doesn't play poker, he should give it a try. He clearly has the right face for it. He continued, I don't want to talk about why I'm here. I will only tell you the ending of the story. I was unemployed for almost two months. I rented a cheap apartment, fell a little behind on the payment, and the owner wanted to kick me out. All my money went towards moving. I'm terribly worried about having to leave my sons, but I can't let my life fall apart anymore. Is your life falling apart? Listen, this is humiliating. I'm not going to go into details. I lost myself when I lost my job, he said while making air quotes. I needed support, but this bitch stabbed me in the back, finding a replacement as quickly as she could. I decided to be honest and did too much for my sons, leaving myself with nothing and no income. I was a noble martyr, drowning in a mixture of self-pity and tanquerage in until the weather turned cold. I had no idea that people have little empathy for those who have no income or assets. You are a mystery. You don't know this, but in my work as a developer, I carefully vet my partners. I want to do a big project in the casino area, and in my examination, I came to the conclusion that you were one of the best people to do this. What I learned about you made a strong impression on me. People like you don't usually end up homeless. His back straightened. Fuck you. People like me don't usually lose their wives to people like you. He said this so calmly that I had to be careful. It was not the absence of emotions, but the ability to hide them. Understood. I'm sorry. We need to put this aside. You can ask me questions, 
but I continue to assure you that I was courting a woman who said she was no longer bound by marriage. He shook his head. She filed for divorce before Halloween and fired me two days later. I didn't argue, left her almost everything I had, and gave my children my share of the money. The divorce was finalized 30 days later. So if you didn't start pursuing her on November 1st, she would still be very much married. Judging by his face, he was telling the truth. I have to tell him my truth, otherwise he will leave. I was right in my research. This is the person I need. We met right after the new year. It was just a business meeting, no different from one you and I might have in any sense. I met her again a month later, she no longer wore rings. We started dating in March and became lovers in April. Six months, she planned her exit, and I'm not sure you didn't plan it with her. Now I won't repeat yesterday's mistake. We swore an oath of honesty, and I will be honest. Mike, I'm looking at it from the other side of the same coin. Why did she hold on to her marriage and at the same time build a relationship with me? Could there be a legitimate reason for this? He accepted my words. This may mean that he believed or that he is considering them. Let me change the subject. If Sue hadn't made things difficult, I would have chosen you as my partner. What if we try to make this happen? Why the hell should I work with you? Well, first of all, I am here in this city, and here are your sons. Secondly, there is opportunity. You can earn so much money in a few years that you will become a rich person. We can develop most of the city in many different ways, and it will all be mutually supportive. As I spoke, he leaned forward, clearly interested in the idea. Think bigger. Why develop individual objects within the city? Let's develop the whole city. Bingo. I hit the nail on the head. He had a real passion for it. I could get to know him professionally and then find out what happened between him and Sue. No one has ever taken on a project of this scale, but I like this idea. Can you come up with a concept that I can sell? His eyes lit up as when he saw his sons. I thought about this while the casinos were still falling. If you give me a month, I can prepare a formal proposal. But let me ask, how much such work might cost. Well, here's the thing. Now it's just a concept, and concepts in my business don't pay. What I offer, you live in this apartment for free. I will provide you with a car. I will cover your expenses and pay you $1,000 a week. When we get the finished concept, we will enter into a partnership agreement, say, 60 to 40. His face changed to an expression of pure anger. Excuse my expression, but you slept with my wife, destroyed my family, and now you are going to pay me pennies to cover my expenses so that I can develop your business on your word that great rewards await me ahead. You probably think I'm crazy. I raised my hands, showing my palms in his direction, trying to soften his emotions. Okay, you got me. Trust me, I made air quotes, would not be high on our list of things we can rely on as partners. I will contact my lawyer. I'll ask him to draw up a contract. I will offer everything that I have just outlined, and you will retain the rights to your concept. When we meet to review your plan, we will discuss the partnership agreement. Larry, this is crazy. I'll tell you honestly, I don't love you and I don't trust you. You are talking about a partnership that is equal in its obligations to a marriage, and this is the very marriage that makes me neither like you nor trust you. He paused, shook his head, sighed, and looked me straight in the eyes. Still, this proposal attracts me. Tell me why me, and why now, and don't talk nonsense, speak straight. Listen, I saw your son's faces when they came down to see you. I also saw your face. I think if you have the opportunity to live in the same city as them, you will do everything to be close. I have an instinct for people, and I believe that you are right for me. You would have been my choice if it weren't for the affair with your ex-wife. Now, I hate to say it, but your story seems truer to me than hers. Perhaps you and I are not in conflict. Mike, I have to find out if Sue and I are really meant for each other, or if I was just a convenient step up. This is a very personal question. I'm sure I can work with you. But if it turns out that she betrayed you, will you be able to go through with it? He smiled. 
It was that smile that says, I know something you don't know. Certainly. To hell with it, I promised honesty. I know for sure that she betrayed me. But whether you betrayed me is the question. Her betrayal is a fact, yours is in question. If it turns out that you betrayed me, we will have problems. I liked it. Well, to be honest, I don't see a problem. We looked at each other and seemed to both decide that this was the best time to end this conversation. I decided to return to the business discussion. Can you at least tell me in general terms your concept for the development of the city? His eyes lit up again, just like when he saw his sons. You could have seen this coming a couple of years in advance. Casinos here will not operate on the same scale as planned. It was a vicious cycle. We couldn't attract enough big players, casinos scaled down, big names stopped coming, high-end stores and restaurants couldn't survive. It was like watching a train wreck in slow motion. During this time, I tried to figure out how to save this area. I have a great concept. Unfortunately, it doesn't include gambling or hotels, so my group just laughed when I tried to discuss it with them. Okay, so what's the point? Our cities are in terrible shape. Because of poor schools, pollution, lack of green space, and insecurity, people have fled to the suburbs. But now the suburbs are also facing problems. So what does it take to make people want to live in the city again? He curled his fingers. First, great schools, not just good or above average great. Second, security, I mean that you can walk at two in the morning with money in your hands and not be afraid of being robbed. Third, urban infrastructure that meets the requirements of the 21st century. This can be done in a compact area, which you can't achieve in the suburbs. Sorry, but these three things are easier said than done, I said, doubtful. I don't think so. We need to change our approach. Let me lay it all out, and I think you'll agree. I wasn't sure I'd believe his plan, but he clearly believed in it himself. After all, an idea doesn't have to work, it just has to sell. The question is, can he give me enough material for me to sell it? As strange as it may sound, I think our personal problems can be solved through joint work. I have to admit, I really like it. His face almost frowned. That's strange to hear. Apparently, he was not as confident as I was. I left with good feelings. I connected Mike with my office to arrange car rental, office space, staff support, and everything else he needed to do his job. We agreed to talk on the phone frequently, but not to meet formally for another 30 days until he prepared his proposal. In the meantime, I needed to figure out what to do with Sue. It's obvious she was lying to me. If she doesn't admit it, we'll have problems. The first thing to do is find out if she will tell the truth. I surprised Sue by returning home a little after 11. Wow, you're home so early, what happened? I thought it would be nice to take my wife out to lunch. The boys have half a day of school today, so I took the day off. I need to pick them up. Do you mind if the four of us have lunch? Certainly, but I really want to talk to you about Mike. Her face immediately became thoughtful. Damn, why didn't I wait until we had time to talk? Larry, that's a good idea, but let me prepare you a little. I wasn't always honest with you when we were, well, you could call it dating. But I promise that everything I said was closer to the truth than a lie. I love Mike very much, but almost from the very beginning of our acquaintance I loved you more. I need to explain this to you and tell you why I did what I did. Do you promise that you will listen to me? I smiled widely and relaxed. She was going to tell me everything herself, without me hinting at her insincerity. This is a good sign, and it looks like we will be fine. I'm sure I wasn't so wrong about it. Sue, this is exactly the conversation I want to have. I'm looking forward to it. We got into the car and went to pick up the boys. When there were four of us, we went to eat pizza. What else? For some time, I dropped out of the conversation. My thoughts returned to the topic. What can she tell me? How can I believe this? There's a reason why she's the VP of sales. She can present any shit in a way that makes you believe it not only smells good, but looks good too. Now her story is, I lied, but for the greater good. This may be true. 
or maybe this is another lie for her own good. How can I tell one from the other? She is also smart. She must understand that if I catch her in a lie, she will feel bad or our marriage will end. So she will have to confess or at least pretend that she is telling the truth. Cynicism helps me in business, but is it worth being a cynic now? We just got married. We are so compatible. Maybe she just fell in love with me and was trying to break up with him gently. It seems right to believe in this scenario. This is what every fool thinks. Larry, you're an idiot. You thought she gave you the right answer, but now you think it was a thoughtful answer. Cynicism is one thing, but indecisiveness is another. Sue suggested we wait until the boys went to bed. She wanted to meet in my office. I was busy doing nothing when she came in. Would you like something to drink? She asked uncertainty. I raised my glass of whiskey with ice. Oh, sorry, I didn't notice. Let me get started. I'm afraid this will be a little difficult. Sue, I promise you, our best chance of avoiding complications is honesty. Mike and I didn't have a perfect marriage. We hid it from each other and ourselves, working hard and being successful at what we did. A couple of years ago, the casinos started to fail, and Mike didn't handle it well. What do you mean, did a bad job? He was trying to balance what I wanted, what the boys needed, and his job, and he ended up not doing any of those things well. Of course, he was right to prioritize this way. Not really. She twisted in place, trying to get comfortable. What was causing her discomfort? That's what it might seem like. But that's not what we did before. When everything was okay, he would tell me about his problems and let me find out what was best for me. And when his world collapsed, he began to hide information, and I tried to decide for myself what would be best for me. Why didn't you point this out to him? I pointed it out for over a year. He denied there was a problem. He denied that he was trying to decide for me what was best for me, and we grew apart, mostly in the bedroom. We found ways to be happy even in our unhappiness. The problem was the fact that he did not allow us to solve the main problem, and it increasingly consumed us. The main problem, not an ideal marriage. The main problem was that we were compatible, but we were never in love. Think about you and me. We have this conversation, we interact with each other. And Mike and I never did that. Was this before or after you and I met? Before. I'm just getting to this. This is the part I'm really not proud of. That night when I went out to unwind, I thought it was completely innocent. I really convinced myself that I just needed to be alone, and that's all I wanted. And then I met you. Was this your first evening away from home? Yes, in the sense that it was not for work. I myself chose that I wanted to be alone. This meeting convinced me that I want to get to know you better, and the next time we met, I already took off my wedding ring. Why, Sue? Can you explain why you said your marriage was over? Larry, I don't know how to describe it because I don't have a definitive answer. On the one hand, I would say that I wanted to bring back what Mike once had and help him get back to that. On the other hand, you just blew me away. I found the man I was looking for all my life, and poor Mike ended up in the background. She looks into my eyes. Her posture suggests that she is honest. After that night, I tried to get Mike to understand that we needed to take control of the situation. I had been promoted to vice president, and it seemed logical to build everything around that. I even suggested that we might have to live separately to find him the right job, but instead he was just marking time. He and I were a good couple. Not great, but good. Besides, we had been together for so long and had boys. I didn't want to lose it. But I saw that you and I could have something great. I knew I would let him go. There is a lot contained in these words. Too much time passed between the time she took off the ring and the actual divorce. Were you lying to me or to yourself? Were you telling us both what we wanted to hear while you were deciding what was best for you? Larry, I know it looks like that, but it wasn't conscious. Mike and I got along great. He was the love of my life. And then he wasn't. It happened over a couple of years, like I said. You can't just turn feelings on or off. I thought I was protecting him. 
defend him. He was lost. The hotel led him by the nose for a year. At first they agreed to change his position and keep him on a tenth of his previous earnings, and then they refused it. As a result, he tried to work in sales, which he was not capable of. He said that he was rethinking himself, but this was clearly not the case. He lacked the spirit, and you and I were falling in love, and I had to give him time to understand that he was on the wrong path. I gently let him go. Haven't fired him yet? He couldn't work three levels below me while we were getting a divorce. As cruel as it was, I did it with good intentions to push him to the next level. What does this mean for us? Nothing has changed. We fell in love. I hesitated to tell my husband. I hoped that I could avoid pain for him before moving on. Over the years, whenever I had a problem, I always consulted him. There was no one to point out. To me the obvious, you can't end a marriage without hurting someone. But I ended it. We are married. My choice is clear, even if my actions were wrong. You told me that you had no contact with him, and now you say that he would be your advisor. We didn't communicate. I just said that if I needed advice on how to end a marriage more gently, I would go to him. It doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to avoid talking to him for several months. Words won't change that. I told him I'm sorry I avoided it. We looked at each other, not assessing where we were now, but rather in the spirit of, well, this is it. She's right. She should have told him sooner, but I don't think the delay is important. It is important that she told him after all. I reached out to her, and we hugged, and then kissed. This physical act will show that I accepted what she said. It may be true after all. She loves me, at least for now. It's not for nothing that they say that love is blind. The facts are clear and indicate that Sue was playing with two men while she decided who was better. But her story might be true, and that would be better for me. Love requires trust. Common sense dictates, trust but verify. Sooner or later I'll have to stop weighing both sides. I'm either in or I'm not. A month has passed. Mike wanted to be left alone, so I left him alone. I was glad to give him time to think things over. During this period, I contacted almost a hundred people I worked with to pitch them a new idea. I'm good at intriguing. Almost all of them wanted me to call again. My home life was very good. I left it as is. Sue and I enjoyed life in a way that I could never even come close to with Jane. We both worked in sales, which allowed us to support each other, give advice, and, most importantly, truly enjoy each other's successes. Our passionate discussions often led to passion in the bedroom. It could be very tempting to talk a VP of sales into doing something crazy. But the fact is that there was no need to persuade her. She usually raised such topics herself first. The only place where things didn't go well for me was in building relationships with her sons. Don't get me wrong, they are great boys. Maybe it's because they're boys, but they clearly enjoy spending time with their dad more. Sue came to see me one Saturday morning after Mike had picked up the boys. Larry, we need to talk seriously. It sounds ominous. No, not really. Although I worry about what you might think, and your opinion is very important to me. Oh, and isn't that ominous? Let's go sit in your office. Sue has a habit of bringing up difficult topics in my office. It's as if she thinks that if I'm more relaxed, I'll be more receptive. She's probably right. We sat down, and she immediately began. I talked to Mike about boys. It is quite obvious that they prefer to be with him. Sue, you saw that I do everything I can to make them feel comfortable with me. I must say, they are wonderful children. It seems to me that we are gradually establishing contact. You are right. In a sense, this is part of the problem. If they made a list of their favorite people, Mike would be clearly in first place, you would be in the top 10. What about me? Maybe somewhere in the top 50. They see me as a bitch who destroyed their family. These are just children. Give them time. You are a good mother. Maybe, maybe not. Here's what I think. Boys prefer Mike. But the boys need to live here. What if Mike and I switch houses? Are you sure you don't want Mike and I to just switch places? What? No, 
I didn't even think about it. I was afraid that you would think I was a terrible mother. After all, that's what my sons think, she began to cry. Women are crying. Some people cry often. But I never saw Sue shed a single tear. I reached out and hugged her. She was shaking, more upset than I had ever seen her. What's really the matter? I'm ambitious. I work as hard as anyone. What kind of mother is this who, when her own sons prefer their father, is ready to simply give them to him? Will you leave me if I can't keep my own children? She was sobbing. Sue, one of the first things I loved about you was your ability to see things as they are and balance your personal and professional life. Your ambition is not bad, and that won't change. You want the best for your boys. A problem solver might see a better solution in what you proposed. Sue visibly calmed down. I thought I could hold it all. I won't survive if I end up losing you too. Say you understand. Understand. I really understand. It wasn't easy for you to admit that your boys were better off with their father. And I think that's true. We are together. As long as we don't break this, we'll be fine. We were still hugging, but she relaxed. We have found peace. I called Mike and suggested we switch houses. He was delighted. But he surprised me by saying that he wanted me to come to my former and future apartment on Wednesday to show what he had prepared. He wanted to start at 8 am alas, these working people are always too eager to start early. I drove up to my former and future apartment and decided not to go into the garage. Today, this was Mike's house. I got up and knocked on the door. It was strange for me to knock on my own home, which would soon be mine again. Mike quickly opened the door. He was full of energy. The door opened, and he immediately began his speech. I have several sketches, some I made myself. I didn't want to give anyone enough information to show what I was planning. There is nothing like what I am about to show you anywhere. You'll love it. Lord, it's 8 a.m., and without any introduction, it's already in full swing. I need to slow him down. Hey, hello to you too. I'm fine, thanks for asking. Of course, I'd like some coffee, if you don't mind. Mike laughed loudly. I'm so on edge. I haven't slept for 36 hours to check everything. He ran his hand in front of his face, from his eyes to his chin. Oh, hi, Larry, come in, how are you? Would you like something to drink? He left and returned with two cups of coffee. Larry, I want to start with the basic thesis that our cities are empty because they are dirty, noisy, unsafe, too expensive, and the schools there are terrible. People fled to the suburbs to find peace, grass the kind that grows on your lawn safety, and good schools for their children. Now they spend an hour commuting to work, they have to drive an hour to go to the theater or eat at the best restaurants, but they still believe that this is the American dream. Okay, so what? I smiled, I knew he wanted to continue, my tone was playful, not dismissive. First, let me describe my plan. As my hotel began to fall apart, I wondered how the city was different from everything we had provided in the hotel. The first thing that came to mind was that services in the city are regulated, but poorly controlled. We have the ability to customize many things that will be managed by the owners of our complex. Okay, and what does this mean? We have handed over too much to the state. I say this not as a political statement, but as a practical one. Education, security, and everything else are functions of the state, and they are terrible. What's worse is that they blame us for their failures. We had standards in the hotel. The shops were independent, but operated to my standards. We must do the same. No wonder you're so excited. You have redefined civilization. Larry, tone down the sarcasm. It's simple. Everything I suggest already exists and is being used. The only difference is that it is done for the community and not by the community itself. Everyone pays for the services, everyone benefits from them. These services are operated by private enterprises. If they make a profit, they prosper. If not, they cease to exist. He came up to a large drawing of a piece of land that I was just purchasing. The drawing showed five blocks surrounded by a wall. There were two entrances, one on the north side, the other on the east. These were the only roads extending beyond the fenced area. All the others ended several hundred feet from the wall. Mike began to explain. 
This area is unique. It was built as an adult entertainment area around two huge casino hotels. The casinos are located four blocks apart, near the northeast and southwest corners of the space. There is a block around the perimeter, most of which will be demolished. There will be a park around our small settlement in the city. Mike continued to describe a fenced-in town within the city. All transportation within the walls will be carried out by driverless vehicles, which may be privately owned or jointly owned. Casino hotels will be converted into condominiums. Many surrounding buildings will also be converted into housing. Family restaurants were envisioned that would target working parents. He was right, it was easy, possible, and most importantly, it could be sold. I was amazed that there were already cars that could drive a city without drivers. His scheme was so well thought out. Each person could own his own car, available only for the use of his own family. A person could own a car, which gave him priority in line, but could also make the car available to others. Some could pay more per mile and get preferred service without even owning a car. Some could pay the minimum amount and perhaps wait longer for a car or share the ride with others. When not in use, the cars return to the communal garage for cleaning, charging, and maintenance. Traffic control was simplified since all cars were driverless. Mike, I have about a million questions. What do you mean by fenced? We'll have to work out the details, but it will be home to 20 to 25,000 people. We have to give them reasons to want to live here. The first reason is safety. There will be no regular vehicle access to our township. Groceries, mail, etc. Via pigeon mail, Mike walked over to another drawing. The southwest corner will be for services like FedEx, UPS, and the post office. Entry for them will be along a ramp into the area under the city. Packages will be sorted and sent home in the same vehicle that takes the resident home. It should be a fun show. We're working on it, but it's not that difficult. Residents of the town will be issued an ID card. They will also be able to use the application. When you want to leave the house, you call a car. Depending on your agreement with the transport service, your car will arrive in a few moments or up to a few minutes. While you are on the street, you will receive a notification that you have packages and you will indicate the approximate time when you will go home. You can also order groceries through the app and have them waiting for you in your car. How is this even possible? Why isn't anyone doing this yet? We are too divided. People own their cars and use them to travel long distances. We live in the past. I don't think we like it much, but it's the American dream until someone shows people a new dream. What about the guests? Mike walked over to another drawing and said, There will be parking for visitors on the northwest corner. There will be several multi-level parking lots, each intended for certain areas of the city. What about schools? It seemed to me that people live in the suburbs because the city schools are so bad. We will have private schools for all residents. One of the reasons people will come to this new city is safety and good schools. How will all this be financed? Contributions, fees, taxes, call it what you want. We will create a corporation and work on its behalf. Instead of paying taxes to governments that fail, we will use private enterprise to provide the required level of services. Mike, this is great. I can't believe how many details you went through in a month. We need to renegotiate our contract immediately. You will need to work out a strategy for creating a city in order to start generating income as quickly as possible. Mike was excited. He had a well-developed concept. There were a lot of details remaining, but this project is what it was created for. He found his calling. I decided that our meeting had gone well enough that he could talk honestly about personal issues as well. So I asked, what do you think about exchanging houses? He laughed and, if possible, became even more animated. Larry, I have to say, a few months ago, it was all over for me. I lost my job, then my wife, children, and home. My self-esteem was gone, and I was ready to accept a dead-end job that would drown me in mediocrity. And then Christmas happened. Home, work, now boys. And soon, perhaps, your ex too. Lord, I hope not. When I think about her running away from me, getting me into a position I could barely handle, 
and then firing me to score points with her bosses, she's just a cold bitch. I'm sorry, she's your wife, and I wish you the best, but if I were you, I'd be on guard and expect betrayal. Mike, let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen Sue cry? Are there situations in which she might cry? Oh, of course, say, if someone dropped an anvil on her foot. Well, if they dropped it from a decent height, she would probably cry. Why are you asking? When she suggested switching houses, she cried because she was afraid that I might consider her a bad mother. Larry, Larry, be careful. She destroyed her family to get another man. Her kids are getting in the way of her having a good time, so she just passes them on to someone else. Do you think tears show she cares? No, I probably don't think so, since I'm asking. I don't want to call you a fool, fool, but get your head out of the sand. She traded for a better option, and now that two future draft picks, meaning the kids have moved on to another team, the trade is complete. I know you're probably right, but she's really good for me. I was depressed, missing the love of my life. I was sure I would never find someone else again, and instead I found her complete opposite. We're really good for each other. A month ago, I couldn't imagine saying this, but you both have my blessing. I sincerely hope that everything works out for you. You just better hope there won't be a period of stagnation. She showed that she knows how to successfully exchange. I decided not to argue with him. We spent another two hours working out the details of his project. When we finished, I was on my way to sharing this exciting news with Sue. Driving back, I was lost in my thoughts. He was right about the tears, and I hoped it didn't matter. Sue is like me. She loves fighting and winning. Now we both feel insecure getting to know each other. I feel like she is afraid that I will see her as a woman who will leave me if I get into trouble. I think that we have something deeper with her. So, as they say in New Orleans, Lay says less bonds tempts ruler, let the good times roll. Why am I worried? Why am I putting myself at a dead end? He won't give me straight answers. I'm with his wife. She chose me because she and I are a couple. She and I are not the same as her and Mike. She longs to be with me. Of course, it was a step up, but a step up to me. Step away from Mike. He just hasn't realized it yet. Sorry, Mike, my thoughts have flown away, and they are too crowded to stay there alone. How do we go ahead and start making money in the process? I've thought about it. Let's start with ensuring security. We'll fence off the area. Then we will start demolishing and landscaping the parks. After this, we will begin to build residential buildings. When we have progressed enough, we can start selling apartments. But what enough means is up to you. What about infrastructure? I asked. Infrastructure? We will have to buy, maintain and manage a private car system. He quickly replied. No, the car system will belong to individual entrepreneurs. We'd like to see at least a couple of competing companies. If it's public property, we all share the risks. And if it is private property, the owner takes the risk and makes a profit. Imagine driverless taxis. What about groceries, dry cleaning, restaurants, and everything else? The old casino will become a shopping center. It will all be there. We will rent out these premises. Quite standard things. It should go smoothly and can provide early income. Oh, but it's not that standard, at least not all of it. Imagine this situation. Mr. and Mrs. Resident and their two children live in an apartment above the old casino. Mr. is a stockbroker and works out of the inner city. Mrs. is a travel agent and works from home. Their two children are in second and fourth grade. Now they never go out to eat in a restaurant. By the time they get the kids in the car, drive, find parking, and get to the restaurant, everything is chaos. And in this new city, they will have such a day. The school drops off the children at the entrance to residential buildings. Most children are picked up by kindergarten staff. Others are sent to a bus stop where a car is waiting for them. Mrs. Resident leaves the children at daycare three days a week. This allows her to work longer hours, which is convenient for communicating with West Coast clients. Mr. calls and says he will be home by 6.30. The Mrs. calls the family restaurant and orders dinner for 6.45. At 6.20 she calls a car that picks her up at the nearest entrance to the kindergarten. 
She picks up the children, and they all go to the restaurant. Mister has a car. He leaves it in a parking lot outside the inner city, locks it in a garage, and then a self-driving car takes it to the restaurant's closest entrance. Everyone arrives at 6.30. They say hello, talk about the day for a few minutes, while Mr. drinks a martini and Mrs. drinks a vodka tonic. Their dinner is served, and at a few minutes past six, they are on their way home. Can we really do this? It will be difficult not to. People don't take their kids to restaurants because of the hassle. Now it will be easier for working parents to go to a restaurant rather than cook at home. No shopping, no cooking, no cleaning. Children will not worry because it will take little time. It's simple. And since many will be stopping by on their way home, the menu can be simple. Meatloaf, peanut butter and jelly, hamburgers, hot dogs, making it affordable. I don't know how long we talked. But for every question I had, he had at least a concept answer. I can't remember the last time I felt so excited about discussing business issues. I wanted to celebrate with Sue. Mike was just making our drinks while I was calling her. Sue, put on something nice and book a table for 8 p.m. Let's celebrate. When Mike returned with the drinks, I noticed his face darken. Well, damn it, there is a huge problem with this partnership. Sue, wait a minute, I said, covering the phone with my hand, and asked Mike if he wanted to join us for dinner. It was crazy, but I thought it would be polite. Well, if you mean that you will have dinner with a serial killer, then of course. If you want my ex-wife with us, you've got to be kidding me. I raised my hand, signaling to be silent. Sue, I'll be home by 7 p.m. See you then. Bye, I said and hung up. What a day. This project will result in at least 20 different developments. You can make a fortune here. My euphoria was overshadowed only by the thought that my partner could not be near my current wife because his ex-wife was my current wife. This fact meant that danger was lurking somewhere, but where exactly? Maybe he just wants to lull me into a false sense of security. When the project starts to gain momentum and I can no longer afford to lose him, he will make a move and take her back. No, that won't happen. This is paranoia. Maybe we'll have a slow start. While I am busy working from morning to evening, she will find herself another, me, now. No, this is also paranoia. Enough, I need to decide what to do. I love her, and she is my wife, which by definition means I trust her. Or don't I trust you? I can't afford to be tormented by the fear that she's looking for another promotion, and I'm only temporarily filling my role. Sue was getting ready to go out or planning a seduction, it was hard to tell. There was a dress on the bed, usually this was her last step. But what she had already put on was clearly not what she always wore under her dress. She was wearing black lace lingerie with thin black stockings and a garter belt. Sue is not only beautiful, but also very sexy. In this form, she could raise the dead, or at least part of him. I saw this as an opportunity. I let her know how desirable she was, started some light foreplay, but decided that we would wait. After dinner, when we get home, the sex will be simply amazing. We both loved French food and wine. We had a table reserved at the Mason de Villocar restaurant, which served French and Creole cuisine. The food was great, but the best thing was the conversation it inspired confidence. When we were about to leave, we summarized. Larry, I've never seen anyone so excited and nervous at the same time in my life. What's happened? I looked at her and forced a smile. Sue, I'm trying to trust you absolutely, but it's difficult. She threw back her head and laughed. Is it difficult? I would say it's impossible. I wish there was something I could do or say that would help, but obviously it doesn't. I should have ended my marriage faster. But if you think about it, I finished it. What can I do now? Well, sorry, that's not why I asked. I can prove every day that we are a team. I'm sorry Mike lost everything. I wish I could tolerate his indecisiveness any longer and leave. But I left. Now we are married, and I want to prove every day what you want to know. Unfortunately, there is no other way out. We hugged each other and said that as long as we were true to each other, neither her past nor mine would matter. We will succeed. Mike and I started to get into a rhythm. 
We made an agreement. Sue is his past and my future. Her name never came up again. When we made this agreement, Mike said that our project would make us very rich. He said that great wealth would keep Sue from looking for the next Mr. Now. I asked him, what if I go broke? She'll leave as quickly as she finds a new Mr. Now. I like Mike. I really like it. But on this issue, I think he is embittered. He thinks his ex-wife is frivolous for leaving him for me. I know that she found a better man and is now with me. I'm not going to get paranoid and wonder if she'll leave. We are on our way to a fantastic future. Larry, 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 let me ask you a question. When she talks to you, does she ever look you in the eyes or does she always speak directly to your dignity? What are you getting at? We've avoided the topic of Sue for too long. You once said that you wish us the best. I'm telling you how well we're doing and all of a sudden you go, Larry, Larry, what's the matter? I said I wish you all the best, and I meant it. But to be honest, you don't stand a chance. You love her, and she loves herself, and your marriage is sorely lacking people on your side. I can tell you directly, or more precisely, right from that very place, that this woman can literally suck all the energy out of you. When we had problems, I would already start to get nervous about her disappearing on the weekends or because she just didn't come home. But soon we found ourselves in bed, on the stairs, under bushes or some other place, and after that I was so relaxed that I couldn't even remember what I was worried about. Under the bushes. I would have thought that you were making this up, but she and I were recently walking from the pool, and, well, you understand, but I'm sure that with her everything is different. It's a pity that she decided that she loved me, but that's how it is. You'll have to deal with it. He looked at me as if he wanted to tell me that I should accept the fact that the sun rises in the east every morning. Okay, I have a counter-offer. You say that you have met your true love, but I think that a vampire has attached itself to you. If I have sex with your wife within the next ten days, will you admit that I'm right? Certainly. Not so fast. I'll need your help. Listen, I don't like perversions. If you want it, go for it yourself. I don't want to participate in this. I don't want to look. I don't know what you need, but don't touch me. Don't rush, he said, and then began to explain. I listened. I agreed. It was a good plan. I thought it was a little transparent, but if that's what it takes, let's give it a try. As I drove home, I psyched myself up. Mike's plan seemed too obvious to me, but if it was going to have a chance of success, I needed to sell it. I got angry, stressing myself out more and more. I walked into the house and Sue heard the door close and walked towards me with her usual warm smile and greeting. That bastard, I almost screamed. And a big hello to you, dear. What kind of bastard are we talking about? About that son of a bitch you were married to. He destroyed me. Are you involved in this? Larry, calm down. Maybe you can give me at least a hint of how Mike ruined you. Yesterday, if you remember, I told you to be careful around him, and you were his best friend. Do you remember this? I was so carried away by his great ideas that I made him a full partner. He retained the rights to his ideas. Now he holds all the cards, and he wants to throw me out because he hates me. I'm completely screwed. What should I do now? Sue came over and hugged me. We'll figure something out. Don't worry. As long as we're together, you won't lose. I really don't know how she can hug me and at the same time unbuckle my belt. After a couple of hours, I was again convinced that life was good. Five days have passed. Mike and I haven't been dating this whole time. I was sitting in my home office and received a message. 11.30 MBR. I smiled. That son of a bitch was right. I looked at my watch. There was still enough time. I got into the car and drove to Mike's house, parking in front of it. I went out and quietly opened the door with my old key. He went up the stairs. Familiar sounds were heard. I approached the bedroom. Of course, Mike was there and he had sex with my wife. The alarm clock on the bedside table read 11.30. Mike looked over his shoulder, saw me and smiled. I'm done here. Do you also want to try it with this woman of easy virtue or should we move on to discussing numbers? Sue jerked, she heard him. 
Larry, I can explain everything. I'm sure you can. The problem is that Mike can too. His explanation is that you are an opportunist who slept with two men while deciding who was better. Whatever your explanation, his version is clearly more convincing. By the way, Mike, I hope you won't make fun of the fact that it only took five days. I'll be downstairs in the office. When you're both ready, we'll talk there. I heard something move upstairs. It seemed as if both showers in the master bedroom and the guest bedroom were in use at the same time. I guess I ruined the mood for them to shower together a little. Mike came down first and joined me in the office. He was in a great mood and smiling. You chose the right moment to come in. She started babbling as soon as you started going down the stairs. I told her that whatever she had to say, she could say it in front of both of us. Mike, you know, under all the circumstances, I wish things had turned out differently. She and I are a really good couple. Despite everything, I'm a little sad. Well, you're still new to being abandoned. A little later, you will feel differently. We were chatting about the project, and then Sue showed up. She was already dressed, but without makeup, and her hair was still wet, tied into a ponytail. Mike and I sat on opposite sides of the room, and she only had to look at one of us. She turned her back to me. Mike, I always knew that you and I should be together. Despite how well Larry and I get along, you and I have a wonderful history and two wonderful sons. She trailed off. I saw her shoulders shake. When she spoke again, her voice was shaking with tears. Give me one more chance. I came to you as soon as... Sue stopped because Mike was looking at the ceiling. I knew where this was going, even if she didn't. Mike, why are you looking up? Well, with all the tears and sobs, I thought the anvil must have fallen right from the ceiling. I don't. Sue was clearly puzzled. Now it's my turn to intervene. Sue, I said, and she turned to face me. Mike is hinting that if you wanted to seem sincere, you wouldn't resort to tears. Although, I must admit, your tears come out great. Mike spoke again, causing her to turn back to him. Masterfully. But to no avail. We'll switch houses again. You can go back to the apartment. Larry will live here. I decided it would be fun to play with her reaction, so I continued. Well, living is a big word here. I will file for divorce within a few days. Then we will begin to figure out who gets what and who will stay with whom. Thank you for getting me out of my blues. It was fun while it lasted. Now I ask you to leave. I saw her brain working, trying to figure out how to get out of this situation. But she simply shrugged her shoulders and, seeing that there was no other way out, smiled and looked at Mike. I really ruined everything. I've lost faith in you. Then she turned to me. And you ruined everything by losing faith in me. She knows how to sell, that's for sure, Mike said, laughing. Are you buying? I grinned in response. It came and went, Mike said with a smile. She shrugged. Mike, I admit, I was stupid for losing faith in you. When you asked, I really thought you wanted me back, and even though I knew Larry and I could have a great life, I wanted to fix this error. She turned to me. Larry, we had everything. I am what you need, and I would never change again after losing my first love, but you decided to throw me away. I wish you both the best. You have no idea what you're missing. With these words, she left our lives. I looked at Mike. What a wonderful partnership we will have. We complement each other so well in business, and each of us saved the other from a bad marriage with a selfish woman of easy virtue, I admit. It was the same selfish woman, and we both chose treason as our method, but it worked. He laughed with me. But in his eyes I saw sadness. Obviously, her words had hurt him, and he wasn't sure that throwing her away was more appropriate than bringing her back. Poor guy, how could he fall for this? And why did I feel the same way? Subscribe to our channel so that your love doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think. Click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one. Click to the next one.